Since the dawn of civilization, a captivating concept has captured our imagination. The prospect of voyaging among the stars, exploring distant alien realms. Regrettably, interstellar space presents a formidable barrier, rendering our current technology futile for such endeavors. Compounding the challenge, light, the swiftest entity known, takes 4.2 years to journey from the Alpha Centauri system, our closest cosmic neighbor. Einstein's theory of special relativity dictates that surpassing the speed of light is impossible. But what if there existed a method to circumvent this cosmic speed limit? What if one could manipulate the very fabric of space-time, enabling traversal of interstellar distances? As far as we know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, period. It's not like we haven't wanted to make that happen. It's not like we haven't looked around the universe to see if we can find something that violates that rule. We have. We've looked hard. We've never found anything to violate that rule. Not only that, it is a fundamental tenet to Einstein's theories of relativity. So what that says is, this speed of light rule is not a limitation of technology. It's a basic fundamental feature of the universe. Now, there are other ways to go faster than light. You can cheat, cheat in a legal way. For example, on Star Trek, what did they have? They had warp drives. Warp drives, what did that do? Well, here's your galaxy, and they're on one side of the galaxy and they want to get to the other. So what do you do? They turn on the warp drive, and that takes the space-time continuum and bends it. And now here's where they are, and here's where they want to go. They just take a little gap through the fabric of space-time, unwarp the galaxy, and there they are. They cross the 100,000 light-year diameter galaxy. Works every time. So that's legitimate in the sense that we know space and time can curve. And if you can control that curvature, you can get to a place much faster than a light beam would have taken. Much less time than it would have taken a light beam to traverse that same journey. I want warp drives that can do that. That would be really cool. But not only that, this little path that they took to cut from one part of their space-time to another, we have a term for that as well. It's called a wormhole. That is a portal in the space-time continuum that takes you from one part of the universe to another. And the more energy you have, the more you can curve major sections of the universe to traverse great distances. And I assert that if we're ever going to travel the stars, if we're ever going to cross the galaxy or visit another galaxy, it's going to have to be in some kind of way that exploits wormholes and the curving of the fabric of space and time. It's going to have to, because our fastest spaceships, if you hop a ride on them today, would take you 50,000 years to reach the nearest star to the sun. And the nearest star to the sun is sitting on our nose compared with the scale of the galaxy. In April 1970, NASA's Apollo 13 mission veered around the far side of the moon, placing them more than 400,000 kilometers from Earth, the farthest humans have ventured from our home planet. For a manned Mars mission, we'd need to surpass this distance 136-fold given Mars' minimum distance from Earth of approximately 54.6 million kilometers, roughly a third of the Earth-Sun distance, termed 1 AU. Neptune, the farthest planet in our solar system, sits roughly 4.5 billion kilometers or 30 AUs from the Sun, taking sunlight four hours to reach it. Despite these vast distances, even our nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, lies a staggering 269,000 AUs away, rendering the use of AUs impractical when discussing stellar distances. Consequently, the light year serves as a more fitting unit, a distance covered by light in one year, as its name implies. By 2025, the Parker Solar Probe will achieve a remarkable velocity of approximately 690,000 kilometers per hour, earning it the title of the fastest human-made object. Yet, even at this extraordinary speed, an uncrewed spacecraft would require over 6,600 years to reach the Alpha Centauri system. The prospect of sending humans there is staggering to contemplate. Nevertheless, such daunting distances haven't deterred scientists from envisioning a concept and spacecraft for this purpose. Enter the Generation Starships. We can travel to the moon for like three days, Mars is nine months, some other planets a year, two years, five years, and we could probably get to the outer solar system in 10 years. That's within a human life expectancy. But here's my point. 
until we discover wormholes or warp drives or something that could greatly shorten the time it takes to travel the vast distances of interstellar space. Journeys across the galaxy will be hopeless unless we take on a different understanding of space travel and say, here's what we're going to do. Let's put astronauts on board that know they will not be alive when they arrive at their destination. But those astronauts will have to be fertile so that they then mate, have babies, raise the babies, they die, now the babies are helped, the next generation is at the helm of the ship. And then they have babies, and this continues. So there's a word for this. We've already thought this through. They're called generational ships. You'd have to control it because you don't want to make too many people, you need the right number of people, plus you have to train them. Or you have to educate them because you need your engineers and your do medical doctors and your space cadets, whatever. So this is the, it's called a generational ship. It has interesting ethical questions. To bring an entire generation of humans into the world whose only mission is to bring another generation into the world with a goal that they will never see. So anyhow, so just something to think about on generational ships. I mean, there's a lot more than what we just discussed but it's an interesting dilemma that we have in the absence of warp drives. Suppose we dared to entertain this audacious notion. Constructing a generation starship and launching a space program aimed at ferrying humans to the Alpha Centauri system. Even in a scenario where everything proceeds flawlessly and after millennia the vessel finally arrives, there's no guarantee of finding hospitable planets. While Proxima B, orbiting the red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, resides within the habitable zone, its suitability for human habitation remains uncertain. Picture the cosmic frustration of the starship's last generation upon discovering nothing of significance in the system. Hence, a more pragmatic approach to interstellar travel is imperative. Another proposal advocates for solar sails driven by high-energy lasers to enhance propulsion. With such technology, a spacecraft could potentially reach Alpha Centauri in approximately 44 years, traveling at 10% of the speed of light. However, the ultimate beacon of hope for galactic travel rests in the realm of warp drives. Though theoretically feasible, their development undoubtedly lies far in the future. Presently, our exploration of space has barely scratched the surface. When people say they want to go into space, and generally they mean they want to go into orbit the astronauts that left Earth to go to the moon. So there was Apollo 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So eight missions left Earth to go to the moon. Not all of them landed, right? As famously Apollo 13 did, and Apollo 10 was just a dry run for Apollo 11. But those are the only people who have ever left Earth for a destination. Every other astronaut Hundreds of them are called astronauts, and we still say they went into space. And what that means is they went into low Earth orbit. So low Earth orbit is in practice where the space station is. It's about a couple hundred miles up. So when people say to me, you want to go into space and, and because somebody's got some orbital tourist thing, and I'm thinking, to me, space is the large scale structure of the universe, not boldly going where hundreds have gone before, driving around the block, as low Earth orbit indicates. There's a functional definition of space. If you want to ask, have you been to space, whether or not have you been in orbit? And that distance is the height above Earth's surface, where you've left enough of Earth's atmosphere behind you that the atmosphere is no longer scattering sunlight. I don't want the definition of space to be contingent on how thick your atmosphere is. Warp drives and wormholes have captivated the imagination of science fiction enthusiasts as two potential avenues for faster than light travel. However, in the realm of science, while these concepts are theoretically plausible, the intricate challenges associated with implementing them for interstellar travel remain unresolved. Despite their tantalizing prospects, the complexities of warp drive and wormholes pose formidable hurdles, particularly regarding the immense energy requirements surpassing our current capabilities. Nonetheless, scientists persist in unraveling the intricacies of these theories, 
fueled by the hope that one day they may unlock the secrets of interstellar exploration using such revolutionary concepts.